1 through 15. And uh, you would take your scriptures, your Bible, and if you're able to, stand with me. Uh, we'll look at, we'll read together, or I'll read, you follow in verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way, and Simon, Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon, told, Simon Peter told them. We will go with you, they said. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you anything, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net because of the large number of fish. When the disciples whom Jesus, when the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord, as soon as Simon Peter heard him say this, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off. And he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for there were so many and they weren't that far from shore. When, he, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring me some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore, and in it was a full load of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he had been raised at the, from the dead. Thank you for your reverencing the word of God by standing. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you would take the feeble efforts of this your servant and that you would just speak to us tonight about restoration. Speak to us about the breakfast that you provided on that day to seven disciples, but focusing primarily on Simon Peter, help us to realize that this was the day that you restored him for future service in your kingdom. And as we think about the great things that he did from this day forward for you. Speak to us tonight, Lord, and help us to see your word, what we, are going to, what we need to be going about doing in our own lives. Because it's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> we see here seven discouraged disciples. They had been with Jesus. There had been 12 with Jesus. And yet they knew just a few days earlier what had taken place. Jesus had been nailed to a cross. He had died a death to save you and me from our sins. He had risen from the grave, but with his death, all their hopes and their dreams seemed to go. Jesus had appeared to them. He appeared to them at the, the, the uh, grave, the empty tomb. He appeared to them in the upper room. But here they were waiting for God's Spirit to come. They were waiting. Oftentimes, we find ourselves in a position of waiting for what the Lord is wanting to do. What do we do during those times? How do we act? Where do we place ourselves? Well, the disciples did what came naturally to them. They were fishermen. And so they went back to fishing. They went back to something that they were familiar with. And here Jesus reestablishes, the scriptures tell us for the third time, contact with these disciples 
by the Sea of Galilee, or as it's called here, the Sea of Tiberias. It's the same place. And in doing so, he solved for these disciples a threefold hunger. First, we notice that these disciples had a physical hunger. They had been out there working all night long, yet they were tired and they were hungry physically. Second, we notice that they had an emotional hunger. Again, they had worked all night long and they had caught absolutely nothing. They were frustrated and they just wanted to throw their hands up, but in doing so, they would have been losing their livelihood. This, these folks had to catch what they were going to eat and what they were going to trade, what they were going to sell in order to feed themselves and their families. So this wasn't just like you and I might go fishing. Well, I didn't have any luck today. If they didn't have any luck, they went hungry. It was a little bit different than what you and I uh, might experience when we go fishing today. These folks were frustrated because they had failed. But there's a third hunger here that Jesus satisfied, and that is the spiritual hunger. It's the kind of hunger that comes from being separated from Jesus Christ. Now, we know what the Lord's Supper is. Last Sunday morning, we partook of the Lord's Supper. This, this evening, I want us to look at the Lord's breakfast. It's exactly what the Scripture called it. This is the Lord's breakfast. The Lord's breakfast the Lord's breakfast, which satisfied all these hungers that we've mentioned, must have been one of a heartwarming experience that satisfied their hunger inwardly and outwardly. It was one of the things that gave them a, a breath of fresh air, if you will. They wanted to follow Jesus, but they were used to, to seeing Him, following Him, doing the things that uh, he told them to do, and now they were without the one in their lives to follow. And so Jesus' appearance to them satisfied each of these three hungers. Now, when Jesus is in our life, we feel him in our life, guiding us and leading us to do things, we know that, we know that these hungers are being met, but there come dry spots in each of our lives. And it's at those times that we need a renewing from the Lord. And that's what I want us to really notice tonight. First, we see here that the Lord has concern for every drifting disciple. You see, Jesus doesn't give up on us when we fall short of what he's called us to do. We're human beings. We're going to fall short, you say. Yes, but we're born again believers in Jesus Christ if we've trusted Him as our personal Lord and Savior. If we've asked Him into our life, we have more than just the power of being, as Stephen spoke to us tonight, about being just a plain individual, a plain man. We have the power of God living within us. Yes, there are times that we will still fall short. But when we do so, we have a, a Savior, we have a Lord that wants to be right there with us, wants to be right there by us, and wants to restore us to what He intends us to be. An old friend of mine told of meeting a barber. He came, to a, he came into a new town and he went to, a, to the barber. He said, where can I get the best haircut? Friends told him, go to see this individual. He gives the best haircut that there is. And any of you ever been to a barber shop know that you get in there and you get into conversations, you talk, you carry on with the folks that are there. It's not just to go in there, sit there, get your hair cut and leave. You, you, you're, it's, it's a meeting place and you are talking to people. Well, this old pastor friend of mine got to talking to the barber and the barber told him, he said, you know, just as quickly as I can, I'm going to get out of this line of work and get into something I would rather be doing. And this pastor friend of mine said, why? You do an excellent job. Everybody speaks highly of you. Everyone gives you high recommendations. Why would you want to find another line of work? And the barber said, well, you see, it's like this. I see people come through my door every day. A lot of them are shaggy. They need their hair straightened out. They need it done. I take my time. I do it right. I give them a good haircut, and they pay me in return. And I'm satisfied when I see them leave going out the door. But the next time I see them, they're shaggy again. 
and everything needs to be done. You never would have known I had anything to do with it to begin with. Well, you see, that's the way it is sometimes with us. We get to the point and we say, well, I'm not making any headway in what I'm doing. So why do I continue to try? Why don't I just throw in the towel and do something I would rather do? Maybe instead of what God has called us to do. It's one of the amazing qualities of, of Christ in that it is his patience with us and his readiness to come and to cleanse us and forgive us as many times as we come to him sincerely seeking his forgiveness. When we foul up, when we mess up, when we fall short, we have a Lord that is there, ready, willing to put his arms around us, to love us, and to call us back into serving him in the way that we have committed ourselves to do in the first place. Many times, I know y'all may not realize it, but many times as a pastor stands and he preaches from the holy desk here and he looks out at the congregation, Nobody in that church, nobody in that building knows like that pastor does when he looks at the individuals in the congregation, the things that people are going through, the heartaches, the failures, the times that people just want to give up, the times when they don't feel like they have succeeded that pastor in many cases is the only person that's aware of everything that's going on there. And sometimes it's not even him. But if people come to their pastor like they should, he's going to know more about that congregation than anybody but the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's thrilling to stand in this place and to look out and see the lives of I remember when this person wasn't committed to doing what God would have them to do. I remember when they were going down a road it was the wrong road. I remember when they were involved in something that may not have been their fault, but they were far from God. And you see people have grown. You see people have moved forward in serving the Lord. It's thrilling to see people's dedication whenever they come to rededicate their lives. It's thrilling to see people whenever they come for the first time to see themselves give themselves to Jesus Christ. Because it says, because the word tells us that the angels in heaven rejoice when a lost sinner comes to know Jesus Christ. It is wonderful to see an individual that's restored, just as the seven disciples in our, our scripture text this evening, they were restored by the Sea of Galilee. Christ showed concern for Peter who had shamefully denied him three times on the night that he was tried. Jesus told him he was going to and Peter said, uh-uh, Lord, you got the wrong person. You're talking about somebody else. It won't be me. And Jesus said, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And of course, we know the story. That the night that Jesus was on trial, Peter was asked on three different occasions, don't you know this man? Don't you know who he is? Aren't you one of his followers? And in each case, he denied. He denied vehemently that he was a follower of Christ. He was scared. He didn't want to get caught up in what was going on with Jesus. He didn't want to be the next one that was put on a cross and put to trial. But we've got to understand the Holy Spirit hadn't come at that point. The Holy Spirit wasn't living in Peter's heart, so it was just the, pit, the heart of a man. Oh, now he, don't take me wrong. He had been in the presence of Christ, and he should have known better, but he was still just a plain old man. He was not. He did not have the power of the Spirit living in him at that time. But praise God, there was coming a time when he was going to be the keynote speaker on the day of Pentecost because Jesus Christ did this thing right here and restored him, took the time and restored him to what he had already called him to do when he called him to be one of the disciples. There come times in the life of every individual when we feel like we have failed. 
when we feel like we've dropped off, that we've dropped the ball, that we didn't live up to the calling that we were supposed to do. That's the ugliness. That's the pain that Peter was feeling. But Jesus was there and wanted to restore him. And Christ showed concern for Peter. And in doing so, he confronted him. He confronted him and told him that he was concerned about him that morning simply by showing up on shore. Now, Peter was out on the boat. Now, according to the Scriptures, Peter had been out there working all night, and it's just like he'd taken, he'd taken his shirt off. and He was hard working. He had got rid of the, the outer garment. It says, I don't really want to go into really what condition he might have been out there on that boat. But it says that when he realized it was the Lord, he put his outer garment back on, he jumped in the water, and he swam to shore. Why? Do you suppose he was more excited than the other six out there that Jesus had come? I believe because in his mind, his sin in his mind was greater. But you know something? No sin, no one sin is greater than any other in the eyes of God. Any sin is breaking God's law and falling short. We have a tendency to categorize sin. Oh, this one's way up here. Oh, this is just a little white lie, so it's down here. It's okay. But oh, no, it's not. Oh, no, it's not. Any sin is breaking God's law and falling short of what he expects of us. But Peter in himself couldn't forgive himself. And so he felt like he had more that the Lord needed to forgive him of. And when he realized the Lord had come to forgive him, he jumped in. I'm not going to tell you what the other six out there that were having to drag the net in might have said. It sure would be nice if he was out here helping to paddle the boat. But at any rate, Peter jumped in and he came to Jesus and he was restored. Why did Jesus care? What was the big deal? What made Jesus care about what these disciples were doing. Well, Scripture is very clear on that. It's because He's the Good Shepherd. And He cares about everything that we do. He cares about anything and everything that we do. Well, let's notice the second thing. We see that this power to save Him, from, came, to save from failure, came from Jesus. Yes, these were the same disciples that he had called individually to become fishers of men. But they had returned to being fishers in the sea. Listen to what John chapter 15 and verse 5 has to say to us. John chapter 15, verse 5. <clears throat> Jesus says, is speaking here, and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If any man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. How many times... Now, I don't want anybody to raise their hands, but I want you to be honest with yourselves. How many times have we tried to do something in our own power, in our own strength, and failed, and ended up kicking ourselves because we failed and dropped the ball? And I asked not anybody to raise their hands because everybody in the place, if they were honest, to have to raise their hand. All of us have fallen short. As Brother Samuel said in his prayer this morning, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before the Lord. There's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves that will make us righteous. It all comes through Jesus Christ. It all comes through Him. 
Now, according to verse 6 of our text, these disciples had been fishing off the wrong side of the boat all night. Now, in my opinion as the kind of fisherman that I, that I am, I know if you don't catch, if you've been fishing on one side of the boat and you don't catch something for a while, try the other side of the boat. I don't know what it was, but these folks apparently hadn't come to that conclusion. And they had been fishing off the wrong side of the boat all night long. But Jesus came to them and said, How many have you caught, fellas? None. You know, that took something to admit. These were professional fishermen. They hadn't caught anything. And Jesus said, drop the, line, drop the net on the other side of the boat. Now, do you remember when Simon Peter got called to be a disciple? Do you remember what happened? Jesus, Andrew took, took Jesus to Peter. And he said, how many fish you caught today, Peter? And he said, none. He said, put your net on the other side of the boat. And again, th at that time, this, this isn't the same time. This is a totally different time. At that time when Peter it came and threw himself at the feet of Jesus, when he called him to become a fisher of man and the disciples. Peter had been fishing off the wrong side of the boat that time too. And so, just like that, a light went on in Peter's head when he said, throw the net off the other side. And then the net was so full that they couldn't get it in. They had to drag it to shore. It's a good thing they were probably only about the distance of a football field away from the shore. If they'd have been way out into the Sea of Galilee, they'd have had a mess. But God has a wonderful way of working through those kind of problems. You see, you see, you cannot build a good life. You cannot build a happy life. You cannot build a happy home. And you cannot build a worthwhile society if you try to do it without Jesus Christ at the center. But you know something? That's exactly what our nation is trying to do right now. It's sad to say but you can go out here and claim you're a Muslim or claim you're some other something or another and you have the privilege that you can pray. But let a Christian like Tim Tebow want to pray on a football field and he's blackballed. Everybody cuts him down. Let somebody go to a prayer breakfast and they are cut down. Nobody wants to give honor and glory to God. We cannot build a society a good society, a lasting society, a worthwhile society, unless we do it on the, on the promise and on the word of God through Jesus Christ. If we try, we're going to end up morally, spiritually, and physically bankrupting ourselves. And I hate to say it, somebody else said it from a pulpit a while back and got in big hot water over it, but the chickens are coming home to roost. You can't leave God out and expect Him to bless you. You've got to do it His way. You've got to do it His way. A recent news story stole, uh, told of a young man who was deeply absorbed in making money. He, he, he had as his plan in life have deep success and to make a fortune. His ambition carried him a great distance and he accomplished his goal while he was still a young man. But it cost him greatly because in order to do so, he separated himself from his family. He separated himself from the people who loved him he separated himself from the people who had nurtured him. And he found himself empty and all alone, even though he had millions in the bank. And he made the statement, if I had it to do all over again, I had asked God to take the ambition out of me. Now hear me, folks. 
The Lord doesn't want us to get rid of the ambition in our lives, but he wants us to use it properly directed through him doing the things that we need to be doing and that are going to last. The scripture tells us if you lay up your treasures on earth, moth, rust, thieves, they're going to come in and they're going to be gone. But again, a righteous man lays up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt and where thieves don't break in and steal. Anybody want to know where that's found? It's in John chapter 10, verse 10. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You see, the poor pauper in the millionaire's eyes might be the richest man on earth because he has Jesus, because he has the love of a family, because he has the love of a church. The scriptures say, what good is it if you give away your soul to get something that's not going to last? What good is it? Absolutely none. And yet people are doing it every day, selling their soul for something that won't last. <clears throat> but the Lord met these disciples on the shore of the, of the Sea of Galilee and with his own hands prepared breakfast for these disciples. Look at verses 12 through 14 of our text again. John chapter 21. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them as he did the same with the fish. And this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. I'm not making this up, folks. The Lord cares about us. If you're struggling, if you're fighting things in life and you feel like you're rowing upstream, you need to ask yourself a question. Are you rowing against God? Because our God will provide all our needs. Doesn't say we're going to have everything we want. But he said he'll give us what we need. And if you've got Jesus, if you've got family, and Jesus has given you what you need, you really don't, you're not lacking for one single thing. You're the richest man on earth, the richest woman on earth, if you've got Jesus and you're living your life properly in his, in his counsel. You see, our, de our needs don't go unmet today when we depend on, when we trust in, and when we follow the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. The disciples faced various needs in life. At different times, they were different things. And Christ met all of their needs just as he does ours. Here they were. They'd worked hard all night. They were hungry. And what did Jesus do? He knew they were hungry. He had breakfast waiting on them when they got to the shore. He fed that, that physical hunger so that he'd be able to, 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 to minister to that spiritual hunger that they had. You can't go out someplace and minister to somebody and tell them they need the bread of life if you're not willing to give them some bread to quit their stomach, to quit growling. They're not going to be able to hear you. They're going to say, if you really cared, you'd care about me. So you see, what we do and how we act makes a big difference in how we're able to reach people with the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But then finally, we see that this longing to reinstate every drifting disciple um, led Jesus to do some things. He had a longing to go to these disciples, to meet them where they were. All they had to have was a desire to turn to him. We saw this 
again when I preached one time before for y'all. The prodigal son. You remember over in uh, Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, he was coming home, but it says that while he was still a long way off, the father ran to meet him. And he said, put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger, kill the fatted calf because my son who was lost has come home. But the part I want to focus on there is that, G that God, Jesus, the Lord comes running to us when we simply realize our failures and that we're going to fail when we try to do it ourselves and we return to him and said, Lord, I want to do it your way. Some people say, I can't go and do this. I can't witness to people. I can't share this. I can't get up there and talk. Folks, we've witnessed a young man come and speak to us tonight who's just about to graduate from high school. He came and stood before y'all. People that he didn't know from Adam's house cat, but he stood for truth. He didn't mind because this is something that's on his, I know this man. This is something that's on his heart. This is something that he believes. It's something every one of us needs to believe too. Not just say words, but believe it in here. Believe it in our hearts. You see, Christ has a readiness to forgive each and every one of us. And he wants to restore us to fellowship when we stray from his desired plan for our lives. When his spirit, or when our spirit is in harmony with God's, it's like, or when our spirit's out of harmony with God's, it's like having a bone that's out of joint. You can ask Rhonda, you can ask my children. My right shoulder has a tendency at times to go out of joint. When I was, I'll just tell you, when I was 18 years old, I dropped a loaded rifle and it shot me and it chipped that ball and socket in that shoulder. I can't throw a baseball overhanded right handed or it'll go out of joint. Now, it happened, have, have, hasn't happened in a long time but if I do certain things that shoulder can drop out of joint and you talking about a pain if you've ever had a limb or, or a joint that's out of joint that hurts. That hurts. And if, we're spirit, if our spirit is not in harmony with God's spirit, we are like a joint that's out of joint. It hurts. Many times we wrestle with a conscience that's loaded with guilt, just like Peter was wrestling with such a conscience right here. And we're crying out for something. Oftentimes we don't know what it is, but praise God, we got a Holy Spirit living inside of us that says when we don't know what to pray, He does, and He, he prays it for us. We have a God who loves us enough. When we're wrestling with a guilty conscience, maybe even after He has already forgiven us. You see, God forgives us, but a lot of times, we can't forgive ourselves. And a lot of times, when God's forgiven us of something in our past, and somebody whispers in our ear, don't you remember when you did this? Or don't you remember when such and such happened? Whenever we start to get on fire and do something for the Lord, guess what? Guess who's not telling us about that? It's not the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he says when he forgives us, he cast it as far as the east is from the west. It's forgotten about. But Satan, if he can whisper those things in our ear and get us to listen, he can defeat our witness. He can make us live a life that's not victorious. He can't take our salvation. Don't understand. Don't, don't, he's not saying that at all. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But he can make us live a miserable life because we're not where God wants us to be and we can't forgive ourselves. That's Satan reminding us. And we need to say, get behind me, Satan. Get out of here. I don't serve you anymore. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of, and I can't remember the rest of the song and I really got my, put my foot off in it. Mercy. 
I hear his voice a cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Let's live victorious, restored lives in Jesus Christ. When we leave the doors of this place, let's take the love of Jesus with us. Because nobody in their right mind wants even their worst enemy to go to a place like hell. Let's take the love of Jesus with us and share it with those lost and dying. Let's bow together for a word of prayer.